welcome you to uh, the 2007-08 uh, season of uh, the Social Sciences Occasional Lectures. And it's a late start because uh, you know, we've had, uh, we had a bit of a funding issue with the collapse of the Humanities Institute. And that was the source of our funding for outside speakers. So it took a little while before we kind of uh, got reconstituted. And uh, even so, we have a very exciting program this season. And you have the schedule down uh, by the door in case you didn't get one in your mailbox. So these six uh, events here will be running throughout the academic year. And um, uh, as, as our tradition has it, uh, mostly it's second Fridays of, uh, of each month. So before I actually get into talking about what we're going to talk about today, I want to say a few words about a colleague who's no longer with us, and that's Ned Peter. And uh, Ned was one of our most loyal friends of the series, and uh, he, he faithfully attended, and very often he did it with a uh, you know, uh, critical mean. Uh, he was an absolute bold and constructive critic of, of anybody who uh, took center stage. And he passed away a few months ago after a long uh, battle with cancer. And we will absolutely miss him uh, for his passion, for clarity, and his probing questions, and his indomitable spirit. And the title of uh, today's discussion is A Time to Remember, Connecting 21st Century Students with the Past. And our panelists uh, are Charles Zappia, who is Professor of Philosophy, Arlene Wolinsky, who is Professor of History, Dwight Furrow, Professor of Philosophy. <laughs> you, what, what did you, I say? You promoted philosophy. him. I said philosophy. Oh, <laughs> shame on me. You don't want to take me off. Professor of History. Professor of History. I will to demote you. Professor of History and Arlene Wolinsky, Professor of History, Dwight Furrow, who is Professor of Philosophy, and myself, uh, Nina Rosenstand, and I'm also Professor of Philosophy. And originally, our colleague, uh, uh, John Corchetti, uh, who is a Professor of History, was scheduled to participate, but he's not able to join us today, so he sends his regrets. And this means that we lose his unique point of view, but we each gain five more minutes to talk. <laughs> uh, and uh, I will introduce the theme of this discussion and uh, put my two cents worth in. And then uh, we will next hear from uh, Dwight. And I will say a little bit about Dwight first so that we can go directly to each speaker. Uh, Dwight, who, uh, of course, uh, like I said, his history is, uh, there we go, uh, is a professor of philosophy. Uh, is uh, in a, a prolific author, and uh, he counts among his books uh, the book Against Theory, the book uh, Ethics, Key Concepts in Philosophy, and a book in Progress, which we actually heard uh, a section of um, last semester, Moral The Morality of Blue Progressive Values for the 21st Century. And next we're going to have Arlene Wolinsky, who is uh, a professor of history spe specializing in ancient Egypt, and uh, Western Civ uh, with emphasis on women's issues, and she has created text for both of these courses. Uh, and aside from that, uh, you know, she uh, takes people on fascinating uh, tours uh, in, in uh, the forbidden zones uh, in, in uh, the ancient parts of the world, and uh, with, with much courage and, uh, uh, and passion. So, <laughs> and, yes, and then uh, you know, Charlie Zappia. Uh, professor indeed of history, uh, who um, has a number of recent publications. Uh, one about history of language, uh, locals, and history of uh, ladies' garment workers, and one on the decline of American uh, of Italian American radicalism, and one uh, or several uh, articles on teaching history in community colleges, which is what we hope we're going to uh, draw from today. So um, I'm going to uh, sit down and. Uh, I'll uh, do my share of uh, a, a speculation and uh, you know, my two cents worth here. Um, and I think, contrary to what we are used to, I think we should welcome short questions in between each presentation, but hold off on probing questions and comments until the second half of the meeting. Um, so why did I conceive of uh, this panel? And it's partly because of a philosophical frustration with an apparent decrease of knowledge and certainly decrease of interest in history uh, among our student population. And uh, that I know I am not alone there because that's you know, why we're here. Now, knowledge of history is not always necessary in philosophy. Uh, and certainly, according to some philosophers, especially the ones that uh, taught our generation um, a philosophical issue is supposed to stand on its own and it doesn't necessarily need to be anchored in its time period. Um, so we can discuss Hobbes' psychological egoism without referring to his violent time period. 
uh, we can discuss John Stuart Mill's theory of the higher and lower pleasures without referring to Victorian mores. But as far as I'm concerned, it helps immensely if we can pull in a little knowledge of the historical context. Mill's harm principle is a timeless challenge, and this is where uh, you know, Mill advocates that we should be free to do what we want as long as it doesn't harm anybody else. But to me, it makes it even more interesting to know that it was written in the shadow of, of what was probably the 9-11 of the British Empire, the Sepoy Mutiny in India in 1857. And Mill was the administrator of the East India Company. So things start falling more into place. Um, the need for historical knowledge, I think, is nice uh, in philosophy. <laughs> it perhaps is not a necessity. But some of us also teach history of philosophy. And then it becomes apparent that many students have no clue where to place the Middle Ages, uh, where to place the Renaissance, World War I, and so forth. If, as we believe, philosophers stand on the shoulders of other philosophers, it's paramount that we get a sense of con uh, continuity of who inspired whom. And it is near impossible to convey a sense of continuity of thought if students don't understand why it was not an option for Socrates to become a Christian. Uh, so. What the philosopher is likely to really want to discuss, maybe we will do that today, is what is history and whose history is being taught. So um, this postmodern change of perspective that historians uh, have also been engaged in, philosophy is, is extremely interested in. But this meta question really only becomes interesting when the basic, basic premise is established that our culture teaches history because we find it to be valuable. So. This is actually a premise I'm going to take for granted in this context, that we do teach history because we think it's valuable. And this is where the frustration comes in. And if philosophers are frustrated with the lack of interest in history among our students, the frustration among historians must have reached critical mass. Um, if we, the teaching generation, believe knowledge of history is valuable, why is there so little resonance among the students, and what can we do to change it? Our students are forced to take courses in history that they don't want to take because they can't see the relevance. I hear students say frequently, because, but that was before I was born. Meaning, <laughs> in that case, it's totally irrelevant and uninteresting. When did this start happening? Most of us who teach and write, we come from generations where we were actually fairly fascinated with the past. And that seems to have dissipated, except for fans with interest in Asian martial arts and so forth. Uh, or some kind of wholesale enthusiastic denouncing of Western history as such, as, as you know, evil. Uh, I mean, that is at least some kind of interest, but it's not the whole story. Um, so, to me, we can approach the subject in two ways. What, number one, what can we do as instructors to open the eyes of students to the notion that history can be exciting and relevant? And two, what might our general 21st century culture be able to do to create a new affinity for history in the new, uh, new generations? And I assume that uh, our panelists will address one or both of these approaches. And also, of course, we will want to hear from you with your own ideas and your pent up frustrations. So my own contribution to this discussion will be fairly brief. As a philosopher interested in storytelling, in its moral and existential impact, uh, I will evoke the words of one of our previous guests in this series from 2005, the film historian Frank Thompson. And some of you may have been present at this talk, which spawned a lot of heated discussion. Uh, because he, too, lamented the fact that the new generation has little sense of history. And he had an explanation, and he had a cure. And the reason he said, and remember he's a film historian, okay, uh, he said it's because today's young people aren't exposed to the historical fiction that our generation grew up with. We watch TV series and Hollywood movies featuring different times and places. And we learn to think of these as exciting. In one of his screenplays, because he's also a screenwriter, uh, he illustrated, he wrote with irony about a particular tiff between a young couple as being spiritual, like he said, the spirit of 76, meaning it was contentious. Um, the young director asked him to rewrite it because, as he said, Frank, Frank, most of our viewers weren't even born then. <laughs> so, even in the movie industry today, there isn't the sense that history used to uh, of history that used to be part of uh, the world of entertainment. Now, Thompson did not say that he thought history should be reduced to Hollywood productions, uh, and he is actually a historian in his own right, uh, especially with uh, you know, Texas history. 
Uh, but his point is that if we have been exposed, if we have been exposed to great stories from the past, in novels and in films, then we have a gateway into the past that can be explored and enhanced by actual studies of the past. So, to many historians, I know this is anathema, because it models the two concepts of facts and fiction. And of course, historians are right that they usually have to battle endless misrepresentations of Hollywood historical ethics. But perhaps the two don't have to be enemies. Now, I, I don't consider myself a postmodernist who gets lost in perspectivism. Even though I'm not crazy about postmodernism. Uh, uh, I do think there are real facts in history. But philosophically, it is the interpretation of the facts that signify what we feel about ourselves and our history. And that is what the historical Hollywood movies provide, a revelation of our notion of identity at any given time. Now, Griffith's intolerance, which I saw years ago, and it's a, you know, a volatile thing. See, it sees the Civil War much differently than we do today. Cleopatra. It's probably more about Hollywood in the 50s than it is about uh, in ancient Egypt and Rome. High noon. Uh, you know, some of you know it's one of my all-time favorites. I use it often as an example of uh, a Kantian movie. Um, is is more, much more about the McCarthy era than it is about uh, a small town Marshall in the Old West. So um, those views in our into our recent past. I mean that is a valuable lesson in itself. I mean that's a kind of history lesson. But the visual imagery and the storyline that the historical movies provide actually do have some significance. And I'll tell you about a book, and I brought it here. Um, I took it to heart years ago. It brought me to the conclusion that exposure to historical fiction, as bogus as it may be, may provide a young person with a spark that he or she needs to pursue real history on their own. Or at least be open to the idea that the past may not just be something that will come back and bite us if we forget about it, or, uh, but something that's exciting in itself. And this book here is George MacDonald Fraser's Hollywood History of the World from 1988. Fraser, he's a historian, he's a screenwriter, and he's a novelist. And he goes through Hollywood's treatment of history, but instead of showing where Hollywood went wrong, he points out where the movies went right. So I'm going to quote a tiny bit here for you, real short. There's a popular belief that when history is concerned, Hollywood always gets it wrong. And sometimes it does. What is overlooked is the astonishing amount of history Hollywood has got right and the immense unacknowledged debt which we owe to the commercial cinema as an illuminator of the story of mankind. This, although films have sometimes blundered and distorted and falsified, have botched great themes and belittled great men and women, have trivialized and caricatured and cheapened, have piled anachronism on, uh, on uh, solecism on downright lie. Still, at their best, they've given a picture of the ages more vivid and memorable than anything in Tacitus or Gibbon. Uh, and to an infinitely wider audience. <laughs> so uh, he says, this touches people. So his point is, what would we know about ancient Rome if it hadn't been for the movie Spartacus? What would, we, would those of us born after World War II know of D-Day if it hadn't been for the longest day? And so forth. Um, so it gives us a basic temporary understanding of different times and different places. And this understanding is what we as college instructors need to be able to rely on to move ahead with the studies of history and philosophy and political science uh, and so forth. So what can we do as instructors? Well, I tell a lot of stories. Uh, I put each philosopher in a uh, historical context. I encourage watching those old movies and sometimes for extra credit. Uh, and when the mood is right, I talk about philosophy of history, of rivaling history of perceptions, the his story and the her story, and history as power and so forth. Uh, and what we can do as a culture, maybe we can get into that later on. But now I want to uh, uh, pass the baton to Blake. Well, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to make a suggestion that uh, I suppose um, people might think of as a radical suggestion here. And this, um, as far as teaching history goes, um, and this applies only to um, lower division classes. I don't think this would be appropriate in specialty courses or in upper division uh, courses, but in lower division survey courses, and uh, perhaps also in high school. Um, and the suggestion would be to teach history backwards. Um, begin with current events, 
um, and uh, that raise questions that a historical account, uh, that you, whatever historical account you want to give, uh, can answer. And I think the, the reason why this uh, might encourage interest among students is that I think it's a principle that most of us uh, adopt uh, in, in teaching introductory courses. Um, that is usually advisable to start with a uh, level of understanding and a level of interest uh, that students currently have. Uh, and then if you want to deepen their interest or deepen their understanding, you can bring them to the next level, but you must start with where they are, not with where you want them to be. Um, and it seems to me that the traditional way of teaching history doesn't really do that. Um, it begins with the distant past, uh, which students uh, are unfamiliar with, and um, presumably also, some of most of them perhaps, less interested in. Um, and uh, it, it seems to me if the, uh, if the goal is to encourage interest, that's just the wrong way to do it. Uh, it would be better to start with what they're interested in, which uh, has something to do with uh, the contemporary age. Um, by beginning with the present, with current events, uh, which is familiar to students and hopefully at least somewhat interesting uh, to them, uh, you would be beginning with what is most accessible to them. Uh, I think that a, a current event um, that is newsworthy is almost uh, always by definition puzzling, uh, unusual, or unexpected. That's why it's newsworthy. So it's very easy then to generate the importance uh, of a why question. You know, why are we in this situation we're in? Um, the, and I think that kind of question emerges naturally out of current events in a way that it doesn't really emerge out of uh, um, beginning with the distant past and then trying to move forward into the present. Uh, the question, what happened next, is a much less active and less involving question than why did this happen. Um, the question, what happens next, it seems to me, invites someone to tell you what happened. It doesn't invite an inquiry. Um, especially because the students don't really have the, uh, the background knowledge to, um, to make the kind of predictions about what would happen next. Uh, so the question, why did this happen, does invite an inquiry, and it's much more likely to pique a student's uh, uh, curiosity. This process of gathering evidence to answer the why question it would also be familiar to, that is the methodology would, would be familiar to students. Um, it's what they see on, uh, on TV, on a TV crime show, for instance. You start with a crime, uh, and then you try to build a case by looking at historically antecedent events that, that gave rise to the crime. Uh, so the methodology is familiar. Um, which again, I think is not really true of the standard approach to history. Uh, it seems to me the historian's skill um, involves becoming very familiar with an incredible assortment of particular details, and then trying to soak in those details for a long time, and then learn to see the causal patterns that emerge out of them. Um, but students don't have the contextual knowledge to be able to gain that kind of insight. And so they end up being very passive. They're, they're not really actively engaged in trying to, uh, to uh, identify these causal patterns, patterns simply because they don't have the skill to do it yet. Um, by teaching history backwards, it seems to me the causal patterns uh, are much easier to see immediately, to see right away. Um, because you constantly have to ask the question, what must have happened to have gotten to this point? Um, with this approach then, I, I, if we were to take this kind of approach in lower division classes, the thought that students come away with this seems to me uh, is the idea that history has deep roots, uh, that we don't easily escape the weight of the past, and the things that happened long ago are actually uh, influencing uh, what happens today. By contrast, when we focus on the past alone, uh, students don't really have much context for identifying those factors that are likely to persist into the future, uh, and, unless the professor actively tries to encourage their understanding of how the past influences the present, they're not inclined to, they're not likely to see what these causal patterns are that still do persist in the present. Um, and in my experience in history classes is although the, the intent is often to get to the present age, uh, most history classes don't quite get there. Um, just because of the time constraints of the semester, you end up stopping well short of, of the present age, and so you never really see how these uh, causal patterns figure in the contemporary age. Um, and by teaching history backwards, I think the present then gives students important clues about what to look for in the past. And, and, and enables them to more easily identify the, the causal patterns that we want them to see. Um, 
Now, I, I said that I don't think this applies to specialty courses. Uh, I don't think it applies to upper division courses. And the reason I don't think so is because it seriously distorts history. Um, I don't think history works in this way. Uh, history does not uh, travel along a straight causal line. Uh, it's not a series of clearly linked events that are aiming towards the present. Um, it's much more contingent than that. The causal patterns are infinitely more complex than that. Um, and by looking at things in hindsight, uh, all of that, most of that complexity, I think, is lost. So uh, I, I don't think that you can learn to become a historian by looking at uh, events in this way. Um, I also think this approach uh, would also be limited because it's not really going to encourage a genuine interest in the past. I think most historians are interested in history for its own sake, not because of what it tells us about the present. Uh, um, and, and so I don't think it encourages that kind of uh, intrinsic interest in, uh, in, in a, a time period from the past. Um, so I think it has its limits. Uh, but I think the response to those kinds of, of objections is that uh, in our intro classes, uh, we're not trying to create professional historians. Uh, it would be nice if they gain an intrinsic interest in the past, but uh, most of them probably will not. Um, and we're not really trying to do that. We're trying to give them uh, the kind of understanding that well-informed citizens need. And that certainly involves a historical perspective, uh, but not necessarily an intrinsic interest in the past. Um, so uh, again, I think this is a rather limited uh, uh, suggestion, but it's one that uh, may uh, improve our, uh, at least our lower division classes if we were to take that approach. Um, I think there are practical problems with taking this approach. Um, and we might talk about their various ways of conceptualizing it. I mean, one way, I guess, would be to simply go backwards chronologically uh, in some, some kind of a strict way. Uh, that would be one way to do it. So you actually would read textbooks from the last chapter and go to the first one, I guess. Uh, that would be one way to do it. Another way to do it, though, would be to, concept would be to organize a course conceptually so that if there's a particular historical theme you want to talk about, you start with the contemporary period and then go back to the past, even at the beginning, and show how the causal patterns lead to the, the present. Uh, so that would entail organizing a course conceptually rather than strictly uh, chronologically. So for instance, you could, if you're interested in teaching about the Constitution and U.S. history, you could start with uh, contemporary debates about the Constitution, about the relative powers of the presidency versus Congress or the War Powers Act or something like that, uh, and thoroughly explore the contemporary issue and then go back to the Constitutional Convention and see what the, the um, framers of the Constitution had in mind on, on those issues. So that would, that would be my suggestion. I'm so glad the philosophers went first. <laughs> <laughs> they, they give us, I think, um, a very, very good uh, structure. Oh. But I, I, Charlie and I have been sort of nodding at each other as you were talking. You couldn't say this. Um, but two or three things. Uh, just before I, I start with the first slide I want to show you. Uh, storytelling goes right back to the Greeks, Herodotus. And uh, I'm an ancient historian. And so when you're in ancient history, it's always a decision. Are you a Herodotian or are you one for Thucydides, which is the which uh, which kind of historian you want to be, and I've always taken the Herodotus side. He's the storyteller, and um, so in that we're we're very uh, agreeable with uh, Nina's approach. The other thing is I've been um, uh, interested always in ancient Egypt and uh, have a good deal of my degree in the ancient history part in ancient Egypt. And one of the things I find, semester after semester, that class is not only full, but overflowing. And the reason is the contemporary world, not only of Cleopatra, but science fiction. And those of you who don't watch science fiction programs, I, I, I'm not interested in them, but I watch them because guess what they do? <laughs> they just pull in all that stuff. I'm, not, I'm sure, I don't know about the, Nina maybe, but... Draco and all these names, you know, and so my students are, well, <laughs> fascinating that this is showing up uh, in a history class and that this has these, these names that they use in science fiction have some sort of uh, grounding in reality. 
which is always strange to me. So with that said, I want to say one other thing and then show the slide. Um, I know that um, in the room, I'm the one who's been a historian the longest. Um, I was inducted into Phi Alpha Theta 52 years ago. <laughs> I have taught the Western Civ class for 40 years on a university level. And I've watched all these years, the changes. And you know what? The students are still as wonderful as ever. <laughs> I've just read my first essays last night. I've gotten through about 20 out of 40, and they're very good. I'm giving them almost full credit so far. I, I have none of those doubts, none of those moans and groans. Uh, I wouldn't say they come prepared. I figure about 10 come in knowing a lot. 10, I'm going to put a book into. 10, oh well, <laughs> those are the ones maybe you see, I don't know. Um, but the others are struggling, they want to get there. One of the interesting things I've decided to do is snare students with modern technology. The minute you say DNA, everybody's ears go up. And they're going, oh, well now she's talking, right? And what I did, and I don't know how many of you know about it, but National Geographic has a DNA study and you can participate. Within the second week of the class, I throw up my slide of my DNA that I um, uh, sent to National Geographic for, and mine is very simple. And the one thing I usually say to students is, I tell them I don't believe in genealogy. We know everybody fools around, <laughs> right? So I never believed my family which is partially Slovak in German. And uh, so I, I sent away for this. It costs $100 to get the kit. And you'll be interested. A lot of students go, oh, boy, what a thing to give grandma for Christmas. All the kids will get together and send for the kit. And you just take a little swab of the inside of your mouth, mail it back, you get this secret number. And then it takes like two months, and then you get a map back. And mine is really boring, by the way. <laughs> uh, and it shows, remember, I'm teaching ancient Egypt, and you know the question comes up all the time? Why are you interested in Egypt? Like, well, look at that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is, this, is this going to show? Yeah. No. There it goes. And good grief, it comes right up the Nile, my DNA. And I go, oh, that's interesting. And then somebody in the class will say, well, everybody's does. somebody who had an anthro class, right? Boy, the discussion goes fast, I'll tell you on this. And then uh, we were just talking about the fact that I'm going to take a group into Egypt, Jordan, and Syria and, uh, over the break. And lo and behold, the other area I'm always interested in, Jordan, Syria. I, 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 when, I, when I learned Arabic, I just sort of ran, I felt, here's my world, I know what they're about. And then you can see it comes right across, and lo and behold, one line, my, my mother's comes right up the Danube, which is perfect, she's Slovak, and my father was supposedly from Berlin. And I look at that map and I go, well, that's me. So I took this map, I show this in class, and it takes, usually the students will show up with their map around December. And uh, they, they come in proudly with it. My, it I, I think I can share this one. My dentist is Norwegian. And he sent off for his. And when his came back, children was from Mongolia. His went, his went all the way out into Mongolia and then came all the way back with, I always, I always laugh, with Genghis Khan. Can you imagine what you can do with this in a world history class? I just do it in my ancient Egypt and my Western Civ. The students, I mean, this is, you know, this is getting personal, right? <laughs> I mean, this is an I history, but it's a good story history. Because after class, I will have students walk up and say, you know what my family told me? They're hooked. They want to know, where's the rest of the story? Our story, his story, and I like the word, my story, which is mystery, right? And I've, I've been just very pleased with the results I've gotten from students. 
Uh, I wouldn't say they hang in there, maybe to be able to bring me their map, <laughs> but they're usually waiting around till the end of the semester to do it, and I've done it early in the semester. So what am I doing in sense teaching history backwards in a very funny kind of way? I have to start with me because there's no way I can start with them, but they will really want to tune into this one thing. And very curious, my Afro-American students, and I have when I say Afro-American, I mean students who are first generation and from Ethiopia are often in my age class. And so when I say Afro-American, it's not just American. Once. But it's it's a nice nice lot of people. This is the other thing that fascinates students. Well, first of all, they like moments. But what I want to do with them is take them beyond that popular stuff about moments. You know, they had in sixth grade. And by the way, regularly I, I teach a class at night, so I get school teachers who are teaching sixth grade, and they'll invite me to come to their classes. And so I know what the sixth grade teachers are doing. And this is very important, I think, for all of us to know, particularly historians, what kids are supposedly getting in middle school and in high school. And I've never taught on that level, so I don't know. But they do the mummification. One even has, one teacher even has them wrap up a mummify a turkey. I mean, in class. Interesting. So I want to take them to the next level. And this particular slide, you can't believe how many people will, in sitting in the class will take off a shoe. Because the ancient Egyptians, there are what we call that second toe is always bigger than what we call the big toe. It's pharaonic, in other words, to have a second toe longer. And sitting in the class, I mean, I'll just have this one slide up, sitting in the class, it's just hilarious to see somebody take off a shoe and say, see, I've got the Quranic tub. And I mean, it's light, but all of a sudden, there's, this is me. And talk about relevancy, uh, it does pull them in. It does pull them in. And then when, what else is she going to come up with that's nutty and crazy? Uh, related to, to what we're doing. And I try very much to be very academic about what I'm doing, try to take them to the next step, try to tie them into the newest technology in my field. Um, I happen to be on the board of directors of the American Research Center in Egypt, so I know every last new paper that's been given, which I think is very, very important to you know, you know, always. And, and I know my, my colleagues are always right up to date in whatever their field is. And the students really tune in. Um, do we have a minute for another? Uh, or not? Okay, I'll leave it. Because this is one more subject. But I think you get the picture. And uh, not only is it both fun, they've learned something. They've gone further on with the, whatever it is they've known. And um, I enjoy it. And that's one of the things I tell students. Don't ruin this course for me. <laughs> I enjoy teaching this class. <laughs> don't any of you become miserable. <laughs> so I don't see a smile on your face. Um, but uh, I, I love this field. Obviously do. And uh, with a little hope, uh, keep them coming. Okay. <laughs> when uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Nina Rosenstand, uh, uh, first talked to me about being on today's uh, part of today's panel discussion, uh, the working title she proposed then was a little bit different from what it is now. It was something like, uh, uh, "How can we make history more engaging for students in the 21st century?" And uh, I, I've got to admit, my immediate reflexive response was, "We can't." <laughs> After some considerable reflection, my more thoughtful response today is, I'm not certain we can, but we have to continue trying. And let me elucidate on these comments by first explaining why I think engaging today's college students uh, in the study of our past is so fraught with difficulties. Then I'll expand upon why I think we have to challenge those difficulties, and I'll suggest several possible strategies for doing so, though I may have to withhold those until after this initial presentation. Uh, first of all, why, why do so many 
students think history is irrelevant. Uh, today, students seem uninterested not only in history, but in most of the humanities and the traditional arts and sciences. I believe the main reason for this is the sharp turn over the past 25 years or so toward a purely utilitarian and vocational view of education. Now, I've I got to make some apologies before I go on here because I, I fully understand that every generation tends to see declension uh, as a disturbing characteristic of those who are much younger. And that started with the Puritans, and uh, uh, you'll remember uh, Paul Lynn in the movie version of Bye Bye Birdie singing, you know, what's the matter with kids today? Uh, or well, some people remember most of them. Um, so I apologize for that. Also, I've got to admit that uh, I, I realize as I become older, I become more sentimental about my youth, nevertheless. I ask you to now forgive me a moment uh, of nostalgia. I'm an unrepentant child of the 60s. You know, that's that period that's known to today's neoconservatives as the dark ages of contemporary <laughs> history. That's a period in which young men and brawless young women uh, ran around naked, and smoked a lot of dope, and actually thought that Ho Chi Minh was a more decent human being than Richard M. Nixon. Go figure. <laughs> Regardless of the merits or the demerits of the broader dynamics of the 60s, it was also a period in which there was a generous amount of governmental financial assistance to those who wanted to pursue a higher education. Now, Lyndon Johnson's Great Society certainly had its failings, but it had some successes as well. And one of those successes was uh, the way in which the liberals who fashioned that model uh, pumped money into higher education because they assumed that education for the many was good for the whole. Government financed or subsidized scholarships, uh, grants, low interest loans, minimally demanding work study jobs allowed working class kids like me uh, to become the first persons in the generational histories of their families to ever earn a college degree. And we did it with limited family expense and very little indebtedness. Today's students face a much more challenging degree path. Uh, educational expenses are so much higher. And political sympathy for the public support of uh, individual educational efforts has just about evaporated. Consequently, here at Mason, uh, one of the least expensive institutions of higher education in the United States, we still have many, many students who are under enormous financial pressures. Uh, their fees are low, but most have to buy books, pay very high rent, maintain automobiles filled with pocket-draining gasoline, uh, and they have to eat. And of course, many also have to support families as well. This all adds up to a clear message. Get through college as quickly as you can so you can pay off at least some of your bills and make at least a somewhat better living. There's just no time for the kind of reflection necessary for real learning. And that's in history or philosophy or anything else. Now, you know, and this is sometimes hard for us to, to fathom because we have a very different view toward education. I mean, I'll give you one example of how we confront this all the time. I have a student in one of my classes in this semester who uh, faithfully attends, but he comes in with a, a, a skateboard and nothing else. No paper, no pencils. <laughs> and he sits down, and uh, for a while, a couple of minutes, he's kind of paying attention. Then he starts to blur and nod up, and then he's like, <laughs> to the rest of class. And since I'm such an engaging lecturer, I know it can't be me. So, um, you know, I wake him up because I, I can't tolerate something stupid like that. I do it gently. But then I talked to him after class and asked, what's, what's the story with you? I said, what, what are you doing here? And so I said, you're not listening. You're not writing anything down. You're, you're, you're sleeping. So, and, uh, you know, it turns out uh, he is uh, uh, pushing very hard uh, to finish his uh, degree, uh, his credits here, so he can transfer to San Diego State in the semester. He's taking about 18 units. And he works nearly full time. And his hours uh, are late night. So he gets home, goes to bed after midnight. But, you know, this class is 9.30 in the morning. So the fact of the matter is, I mean, he's under enormous strain. He cares much less about anything he might be able to learn in my history class than he can to simply get through the damn day and, and, and hopefully get through the, the college and, and be able to make a little bit better living. And you know, this is a, a real pressures that the, they have to live with and we have to deal with in one way or another. 
In addition, I think the common, and, and, you know, and I'm not blaming students for this, that's the easiest thing to do. These are social pressures. The combination of pressures to earn and the new dominance of the conservative belief that education is merely an individual pursuit of skills and certification to be used for private gain. You put those things together, and that has degraded higher education to the status of nothing more than vocational training. Uh, it, not just here, but elsewhere. And again, let me get personal. When I started college in 1965, uh, the university I attended, like most of those I had visited, in all honesty felt like a sanctuary to me. Uh, not from the struggle for social change, not from political involvement, not from cultural engagement, but from the hurly-burly of the marketplace. You know, we all knew that we were soon going to have to make a living. That's obvious. But that was only one of the reasons we were in college. An education we were told and we strongly, almost religiously believed, was to help one learn to make a life, not just a living. Times I fear have changed. Recently, the California Education Roundtable, a business-dominated group of concerned citizens, insisted that the primary obligation for all colleges in this state is to ensure that Californians have access to an education that will give them the tools they need to be, quote, productively employed throughout their working years. Unquote. Period. I mean, there are even deeper roots to this kind of presentism and individualism, which, which underlies this vocational turn. Uh, you know, Henry Ford made a you know, very good car, but wasn't much of a social theorist, but, but, but had things to say anyway. Uh, it's, it's sometimes remembered for uttering the famous phrase, history is bunk. You know, Ford's point of view was, what the hell do I care about what a bunch of dead people did a long time ago? What's important in America is what I'm doing today, and better yet, what I'm going to do tomorrow. And there was always this focus that, that, uh, that the present and the future are far more important, uh, making the past in many ways much more irrelevant, I think. Um, in addition to this kind of um, presentism, I think, the individualistic part of that equation posits that what has made America great has been the efforts of great individuals, men, mostly Anglo-Protestant men, rarely women, who because of their own talents and through their own efforts achieved individual gains that when combined with the individual exploits of other achievers built the temple of wealth and power in which we all worship. When prior, of course, to those horrendous 1960s, history was taught as a moral commentary on the individual exploits of presidents, generals, and businessmen like Henry Ford, it was in all honesty more popular with students. Since the late 1960s, when history took its social and cultural turn, the exploits of the powerful few have been pushed backward, while the struggles of the powerless many, particularly those who are unwhite, have gained more scholarly attention. The problem is that the focus on social history is not compatible with the post-Reagan era return to the general preference for remembering the past in heroic personal narratives, stretching from adjutory comments about the books about the famous, like John Adams, uh, to respectful popular paeans, uh, to veterans of the America's wars, like the Ken Burns' recent documentary. Uh, it, it, and, you know, it, this is all supported, I think, by uh, the criticism, uh, maybe mostly from the organized right wing, uh, of the alleged weaknesses of history education. You know, arguments that really students today are deplorable in their lack of understanding of history. And this is obviously because these history educators have failed them miserably. Now, those comments are usually based on particular kinds of studies, again, by very bankrolled, you know, SCAFE Foundation funded uh, study groups. One recent one, uh, for instance, uh, uh, studied the historical knowledge of, uh, uh, of juniors and seniors in American universities, and they gave them exams. Now, the, these exams were multiple choice format exams. And they asked them questions like, um, which of these uh, Supreme Court cases established the principle of judicial review? And if you somehow remember it was Marbury versus Madison, you knew history. The problem is, if you did remember that little factoid, does that mean that you knew anything about what judicial review is? 
or why it's important and, and, and why it's a component once you know about history. It, it, it proves nothing. And, uh, and you know, it's, again, it, it's this sort of emphasis upon um, uh, how a scholars who want to waste a hell of a lot of time, time uh, talking about, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, former slaves who uh, fought with the British against the Americans in the War for Independence, well, who do you know, who gives a damn? Uh, uh, they, they should be spending their time getting people to, to memorize uh, uh, facts like uh, uh, the significance of Marbury, or at least the, the memory of Marbury versus Madison. And, uh, you know, all these things are kind of, uh, add to that devaluation uh, of history as an academic enterprise. Now, uh, having been so negative for 15 minutes, <laughs> uh, I think I'm going to stop at this point and assure you in doing so that I do have some suggestions about how we can attempt, at least, uh, to make history more appealing to our students today. I attempt it uh, every year. I've been doing it for about 30 years. Uh, I've failed for about 30 years, but I'm, I'm still going to try. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, now's a good time to uh, engage in a broader discussion uh, with uh, with the audience, but also uh, amongst ourselves. So, any questions? Bear with me. I'm thinking off the top of my head on this. It seems like the reasons why students are disconnected and our desire to have them connected are two very different issues. Um, Wanting them to be interested tells us a lot more about ourselves rather than the reasons why they are disconnected. And I'm thinking why we are different. I mean, I was steeped in history, why I loved it, and I would assume many of you guys were. Is there something really different about us than them? And one of the things that hit me is that most of us, at our ages, were the sons and daughters of people who went through the Depression, who were sons and daughters of people who went through World War II. My father is a World War II vet. I remember going to the longest day and having my father say, it wasn't like that at all. You know? And all my uncles were Marines in the Pacific who hated Japanese right into the 90s before they died for understandable reasons, from their losing a lot of friends and whatnot like that. And so it was my attempt, because I admired these people, that gave me an incentive to want to know. When you got kids now whose parents were from the 60s in Vietnam, maybe they got good reasons to not want to know, because they're not proud of them. Whereas, you know, we have, we have an implicit pride. I, I think there's a parallel here, too. For instance, my best friend that I go out every weekend is a German. Germans know nothing about their history in the 30s and 40s. Totally. I mean, it's, it's non-existent. Same with the French. You ask the French about the uh, Vichy government or Pierre Laval or people like that, and bing, nothing there, you know. I think there's something here that if you pander to people, you will get them back. But then you have to artificially make them get some pride out of some connection here. In the absence of real pride, I kind of wonder if there's a possibility of making a real connection, ultimately. I mean, Vietnam, it's, it's geez, we lost, for Christ's sakes. No, no civilization is real big on teaching their kids about their losses. I bet you the Persians are not big on reading Herodotus. You know? you know, it's not a bestseller in Persia, be my guess. You know? <laughs> but it's probably high in Greece, and that, that's an angle I want to pursue. Okay. There's a big difference between not knowing your history uh -huh. and not talking about your history and misteaching your history. I find it very difficult to believe the Germans do not know their history. Oh, like well, I find it very they don't. I, I grew up in a different country yeah. where I find it very difficult to believe that um, I know actually I do believe that the other part of the country doesn't know the history because they misteach their history. So I I find it very difficult to believe the Germans at the time, didn't know their history. 
They just didn't speak about the history. Well, so now they my best friend them. was born nine months in Berlin after the defeat. Uh, it was February of 46, nine months after. And he said throughout his whole schooling, whether you talk to your parents or not, it was all... So they didn't talk about it. They didn't, they didn't talk teach. about it. It wasn't taught in class. So it wasn't, it wasn't the, like, so the, my point is there are differences between the things. So they didn't teach their history. Well, my point is Poles would know more about German history than this time than Germans. Because it serves their interest to, you know, it feeds it. Yeah, let me add something to that, that when, when the TV series Holocaust was running in the oh, 70s, uh, yeah, the, German, the German young people, they had no idea. It was a uh, complete, complete shock to them. They went home, they asked their parents, could th this really happen? Because it was the first they ever heard of it. So That's absolutely. But that was, was what, 77? Yeah, yeah something like that. Yeah, but, yeah, but what was, if the parents knew? Somebody there knew. Oh, just the, the, par the parents knew, but they weren't talking. Right, they just didn't yeah. so like There's the nothing to be proud of. Talk right. about it. But, but I was thinking you were saying that it, there's the Vietnam era trauma for the nation and, and the uh, you know, critical attitude uh, from, from the rest of the world. Uh, there are other things that one can focus on. One can focus on the space program, which was uh, you know, an amazing contribution to you know, history. And uh, you know other technologies, uh, civil rights movement. You know, there's there are a lot of things that one could focus on and, and be proud of. Uh, so it's a, there. It becomes a matter of choice in, in in some ways, I think. But if you have children now, so many of them, there was you know there's divorce in there. When there's really not much that they can pick from to be proud of, maybe their inaction is actually a choice rather than just, you know, a default position. There, there's a reason why they're uninterested, because it protects the psyche from, you know, pain. That when things flatter us, we're interested in it. When things are likely to cause us pain, we naturally avoid it. I just want to go to jump. You know, when I do I do teach a course in the Vietnam War, and uh, what, what I found, you know, years ago when I first started teaching it in, in the San Francisco State in the early '80s, I was getting uh, uh, students and Vietnam vets. Now, Vietnam vets are old people like me now, so I'm not getting them anymore. Now, I'm getting their children, and in a few cases, their grandchildren, and they actually are very interested in the war precisely because their parents, uh, in most cases, fathers, wouldn't talk about it. Uh, you know, for a variety of reasons we could, we could get into, uh, but but they have the interest very much. They're they're not ashamed. Uh, they, they want to know what. Right. They're you doing. said that was a class, and so people who are interested in it would take that class. class. We're just. I think we're talking about a broader thing. Why there's a general, you know, disinterest, and I'm just focusing on maybe that you know there's there's some good reasons why it's happening. Um, I don't want to belabor. Uh, issue about the Germans, uh, but I lived in Germany uh, for almost 30 years. And from the time of 1963 to 1990, my children are German and American. They went through the entire German education into uh, Abitur, which is uh, like uh, pre-college, and then into university, the University of Munich. They were taught about the sec what happened uh, during the time of Hitler. Uh, and every year, it is not true uh, that the uh, German um, television does not present documentary films. Oh, yeah. Spiegel of does, does an article all the time. Auschwitz and the entire history showing Hitler and the entire structure, how he began and the end every single year. Now, you can't force everybody to look at those things. Right. But those things are there. Because we're, I saw... We're, we're like, not oh. talking about how many books are in the library. We're talking about how many people are not going to the library pulling the books out. But you're talking about that students are... that people don't learn those things, and that is not well, a fact. Why, why, would the, why would the Holocaust movie cause a sensation? What? The, the series actually caused an after that's why the word Holocaust came to us because mm -hmm. prior to that we called it the final solution right. it was the Entlosen but you know it, the Holocaust in 77 caused a sensation what I did experience in Germany 
uh, because I was very integrated, my former husband is German, uh, is that many of the people that I spoke with and asked questions, to, uh, especially the elder community, uh, said they had no idea things were going on. And you could tell that they were really, or most likely, not telling the truth. Especially uh, when um, uh, the camps were just uh, not even 10 miles away from uh, the downtown, the middle of downtown Munich. <laughs> so you knew uh, that in the elder generation, that maybe they were really trying to just block it out or not feel guilty but not the generation that my children belong to. And um, when was your first I kid born? Experience. They when? are very well educated in their history. When, when was your first child born? Oh, my first <laughs> child was born. This year. Uh, it's probably almost as old as you. My first child was born in 68. Okay. Well, I was just going to say the Holocaust thing came up because that changed I, I, big time in Germany. I, I would say that. By the time you ki your kids went to school, a new generation was there, yeah. and, That's what I'm saying. And, and the attitude was, now we have to know, we have to take on the oh, burden, yeah, and face the past. Yeah. 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 I, I wanted to expand on Charlie's point, where he said, said that it's not really history, per se. It's, it's, in, it's in the humanities as a whole, and I'd like to actually expand that to the social <coughs> sciences as well. I find that if my students aren't interested in Andrew Jackson and the rise of the Democratic Party, it's probably because they don't know beans about John Kerry and the Democratic Party today. And if my students aren't interested in the market revolution of the 1830s, it's probably because they don't know beans about the market that exists in capitalism in America today. I, you know, it's, it's, it's funny, in the progressive era, we, we uh, have the, our textbook talks about the direct primary. Well, I figured out pretty quickly, it's not a matter of teaching the direct primary. My students didn't know what a primary is. So how do you teach history to people that don't have the building blocks? It's not, it's not a lack of knowledge. It's not a lack of interest in history. It's a lack of awareness in the basic building blocks that make up history as well as as well as today's life and I and I find the way to deal with it is to go back and forth I mean I I, I don't I don't teach history history backwards I teach history kind of like with instead of flashbacks I have flash forwards I say you know now we're talking about the rise of the Democratic Party with Andrew Jackson what are political parties what two political parties do we have today there's always someone in the class that knows we have two political parties and can say what they are. <laughs> that, 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 gets us off, that gets us started when we want to talk about progressive reform. What is a primary? Did anybody vote in June? There's usually someone who remembers voting in June. Though once, when there was that stupid March primary, they actually had a class of 35 people and not one of them even knew there'd been a primary. And this was in June, okay? Uh, but that was that stupid March primary. But 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 um, the but usually there's somebody that remembers voting in a primary. So we can start to talk about what is a primary, and did you know that this comes from the progressive era and and the initiatives? People remember one or two of the initiatives that were on the ballot recently. Did you know that this comes from? This is a California. This is something that's that's very very much not unique to California, but that we've had in California since the early 20th century relates to the progressive era. You go, you go back and forth, and, and I, think, I think the key is that it's not a lack of interest in history. It's a lack of awareness about the building blocks that make up history. Anybody want to comment on that? Well, I mean, this, this would be part of my concern with, with Dwight's interesting proposal. Um, which seems to be based on the assumption that students actually do have an awareness of the events. I have not found that, in all honesty. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that's one of the problems. But still, connections are important. And, and I do the same thing you do in the sense that uh, I'm very chronological rather than topical, and I go from back to forward. But I continually 
make connections as closely as I can to, to uh, present day events. I do that in every single class, uh, and uh, I, I do it uh, uh, fairly successfully. I mean, I, I will see students who will make some greater connections then, but if I can, uh, if I'm talking about, uh, uh, for instance, uh, the, you know, the, the, the AFL endorsement of Woodrow Wilson in 1916. It's sort of the first time uh, the organized labor movement in the United States so, uh, moves toward what will soon become its, uh, you know, a tight embrace with the Democratic Party. And, uh, you know, they know that. They, 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 some of them know that uh, most labor unions support Democratic candidates today. This is the genesis of it. So you can make those connections. Yeah. Uh, let, me, let me add to that. That, I mean, that was one of the things that, that I wanted to bring up about if you can't, if you can't zero in on an area in uh, the current in the current climate that triggers um, you know, interest uh, and hopefully even passion, uh, then you don't have the hook to take you further back. Um, oh, indeed. But so, what I had, had in mind was that you actually teach an awful lot of current events before you even start with the history. Uh, so I agree with Charlie. You know, many of our students don't understand even basic, you know, the basic building blocks and so on of, of contemporary society. Um, so you have to teach that, but teaching that first, it seems to me, is essential, and then uh, trying to, to go back and picking up the historical thread. Uh, but I use analogies with something they can relate, sport, although I know very little about sport except for soccer, uh, politics, and I encounter the same problem that he does. I ask, you know, uh, how many of, of you know this? Very little. Very little, so there's very little, in, very little interest. So, uh, but I keep trying. I keep trying. I, keep, I just want to make a, a, a comment about. I don't know if it was Ryan or, or Nina said something about Socrates. Uh, it's impossible, in my view, as an historian, to understand Socrates without the historical background. The whole point is that the uh, democracy, Athenian democracy, failed because. Uh, because of the uh, historical background. So I, I don't think it's possible to just extrapolate this, this philosopher and, uh, and talk about them without the history of what happened before, because Plato goes exactly on the other side because of the failure of the uh, democracy. He saw the democracy is worse. And if the, the students don't understand that, that's an historical question. It's not really a philosophical question. She just so said he couldn't be Christian. Yeah. That was her point. So my point was, was a very basic one, that if there is, uh, you know, if there is that much of a disconnect oh, between, okay. uh, between the, uh, the understanding of the time period uh -huh. of the philosopher and the options that were available to him or her, uh, then we do have a lot more prep work to do in order to connect with the students. But I do have to, I mean, as a philosopher, uh, I, I do want to say that uh, we do, uh, on a regular basis, isolate the philosophical questions from their historical context under the assumption that they have a um, uh, timeless uh, appeal uh, and that the, uh, the questions that are, are addressed uh, can be addressed at any point in time because they are uh, they're either universal or they are you know, completely abstract. So we do that a lot. And uh, even with, with the Socratic questions, we don't necessarily need to connect them to uh, to the time period. Although, of course, as far as I'm concerned, it makes it easier and it makes it, uh, it to me, it makes it more interesting. But we can take such uh, a, a question as, uh, you know, do, uh, uh, do the gods, uh, you know, um, uh, prohibit something because it's wrong, or uh, is it wrong because the gods prohibit it? Uh, I mean, that's that's uh, one of the classic ways that it's, you know, do they allow it because it's right? I mean, but so that's just a different version of it. But, uh, you know, that's a classical question from, from the, the youth of Rome uh, that anybody can ask at any point in time, and that's part of the strength of uh, the history of philosophy that we encounter these questions that mean something to anybody, anywhere. Um, and that's why I'm saying that philosophy does not necessarily have to hook up to history all the time. Well, just one more thing is I always encounter this problem of moral and ethics. Every time we talk about moral and ethics in history, somebody raises their hand. I think I shared with Ryan once, and they say, "Well, I wasn't told it's like that in philosophy, you know." So I mean, then we're blocked right there in a in a 
in a situation with, you know, and I'm saying this is not morally as the government tells us morally, you know, we're not talking about sex or whatever, we're talking about, you know, the way the uh, governor is done. The problem of moral ethics is really an issue, and, uh, and I wish we could find a way to uh, sort of merge that in between philosophy and, the, and the history. Of course, the story of the Clinton story was all about moral, and nobody asked a philosopher, everybody asked a religious uh, preacher or something, which was you know, very, very strange for me, because right there you have the uh, philosopher that they could talk about morality, but nobody uh, you know, raised the issue. So I think for the students, it's, it's very hard to make this connection. I'm sure Charlie won't. Well, I mean, I'm just gonna say, I, mean, I think the most sophisticated philosophers and historians uh, don't have a problem with this. I mean, because uh, talking about the timelessness of certain values or certain human conditions uh, does not deny the, the significance of their historical context uh, for, uh, for a good philosopher, and likewise for a good historian, uh, talking about that specific historical context doesn't deny that there is some timelessness to, to some of the things humans are experiencing there. So, uh, I mean, the problem is, you, you know, if you're teaching a history course, uh, you're going to have a different uh, sort of methodology Absolutely. than if you're teaching a philosophy course. Uh, but especially since you, you mentioned that uh, the, the go-to person becomes the religious scholar rather than the historian or philosopher. And that's, of course, something that, that we uh, see all over the place, which is probably <laughs> based on the assumption that you can't have morals without religion. And it's one of the things that we in our philosophy group end up talking about endlessly. We um, find it endlessly. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and we, we gravitate toward that topic over and over again. Uh, and uh, it, it's it's not solved un, until we we uh, you know get a general cultural emphasis that uh, yes, indeed, you can have morals without religion. Well, a couple things, uh, and this is this is, I'm not a historian, but I. I found it, you know, a, a, the same kind of thing, you know, when I started college that Charlie was thinking about. It was like people seemed to want to know these things, and then I got there and I thought, I didn't know any of this stuff. And I thought, well, okay, better get busy and find out what everybody knows. Uh, but, you know, Dwight's thing about teaching history backwards, I thought, was a, was a good idea. Although, I don't know if you had seen this, there's a series that was done by uh, this guy named Burke. Uh, it was called Connections. Edward. Edward Burke, is that right? And, rather, and it was kind of a back thing, but it was more like starting with, like say, start with the uh, the space shuttle taking off. And then he'd go, rather than going backwards, he'd go all the way back to where he wanted to start, and then go back towards that. Now, it was, it was kind of heavily on technology mostly, I think, as I recall. But still, it seemed like a great idea, and he would, you know, find all the connections between this, you know, Technology and go way back and, and, and work his way through there with uh, people that you wouldn't ne necessarily hear, maybe even, even in a history class, you know, just kind of obscure kind of people that were on the fringe of stuff. And I always thought that was a good way of doing it. I, and I agree, I think you would do that in an introductory class rather than, than otherwise. But this, doesn't that already make an assumption that somebody would be interested? I, I, I'm, I'm thinking does, yeah. we're no, we're staring at a symptom. We're we're staring at a symptom that we're not noticing. For instance, nobody reads newspapers anymore. And you know, and it's and they're trying their damnedest to sell papers, and it's in their financial interest to try to get people interested. And people aren't interested. And how can you go backward if they don't even care about today? But part of that, I mean, nobody reads newspapers, but I think part of it is also that nobody reads, uh, not just new, newspapers. We were a generation, of course, we, we watched the great movies, which uh, you know, I love and so forth, and there were all the westerns on TV. But in addition to that, we, we read novels, and we read short stories, and we read newspaper articles, and we read magazines, and so forth. We were voracious readers, and uh, you know, I find that, that for most of the new generation, they read if they have to. Uh, and... Uh, well, that part goes back to what Charlie was saying, that uh, we don't have a lot of time to read right. uh, in, in our culture. Well, I think that the second thing I wanted to say was just exactly that. In other words, in speaking to the, the, the main issue, which is why is there such a problem? Okay, so that was like a way of maybe doing it, but I think you can't underestimate the things that Charlie said about the social pressures on students nowadays. You just can't. Yeah. And, you know, so maybe a lot of the interest, lack of interest, isn't necessarily there. It just, there's... There's no way to put that in your day. And I think it's important for us to, to let our students know that we recognize that, rather than condescend to it, just say, you know, well, yeah. you, you 
jerks. Like, why can't you just read this thing? Right. I think we have to recognize that on the other hand, we can't say, okay, um, you have no time, you have no money, so forget about the reading. <laughs> Can I come? Uh, one, one of the interesting things, I teach at night, and I've always taught maybe one or two classes at night. And I had maybe 15 years ago, I started getting students who were coming back who had majored in economics or business or had MBAs or were computer somebodies. And they decided to come back to school and do humanities. And they said, you know, these jobs that we've had are eating up our souls. And the reason I say about 15 years ago is because now three of these people have contacted me. They finished their PhDs in ancient history, in classics, and in Egyptology. Out of Mesa College, out of an evening class, with, with master's degrees, usually from National University, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Roll our eyes over that one. And they said, I went out of the corporate world. And, we're, and my husband can, can attest to this one. We, we have them every semester that they've become good friends of ours because they've said, I want back. I, I want to go to the humanities again. Or I want to be a philosopher. I'll bet if either of you taught it. Well, you teach at night. And do you get people who are coming back and uh, who are older? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, people we hear from later on yeah. in their on their Right. Day. And particularly, you've taught as long as I have. I mean, you can't believe the list of of old friends from 30, I mean, I even have this, uh, this uh, a student two semesters ago, two years ago now, who was a student of mine in 1972, went to live in Australia, came back and said, rolled in a class <laughs> and said, hello, I'm back. <laughs> and I'm really now wanting to be, she wanted to be a museum curator. And she'd been in business, Snap on tools. <laughs> I mean, in, in Australia. I see their truck. <laughs> you know, so there is this hope. There is hope. Yeah, and I, I guess we shouldn't forget that we're really dealing with individuals. We're not dealing with uh, groups of people. With statistics. Yeah. I think it's really important that you have a, an expectation that people will be interested in the material. Uh -huh. it's, it's, I think it's absolutely critical. I, I, I find that I, if I just come at it relentlessly with the attitude that I, I, don't, I, I don't like it when people say someone makes history come alive. To me, history is alive. And, 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 and maybe, some people, maybe some people don't know what history is. If they think it's not alive, they don't understand what it is. And I come at, come at it with the attitude that history is alive. These people are going to be interested in history. And, and, I, and if you expect them to be interested in history, they're much more likely to, be, to, to follow along and be interested in history. And another thing I've found is that it's, it's really, really true that students have trouble accessing what we're talking about because of, their, because of their busy, busy lives. But you know what? When something is hard to attain, it often appears more valuable. So I try to emphasize how challenging it is to learn history and 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 how this is something that people are going to have to work extra hard in order to master and how actually <coughs> learning history and doing well in the class will actually change your life and bring you to another level that other than where you are already and people get the idea that oh my gosh this this person uh, you know that this this professional you know, person who knows all this history is coming at is coming at this from an angle, and they're curious, they're interested, you know, how do I pick up on this? How do I pick up on this awareness and develop these skills? And, and, and if it's hard to attain, that actually makes it appear more valuable and more special. Whereas if you, if you try to dole it out and try to say, say, oh yeah, well I'm not going to make this course very challenging because I know you're all way too busy and way too tired, and I know you're not really interested in history, so I'm going to, like, you know, show show you a movie or something, then you see how that's that's completely defeating what you're after. That's completely defeating it. You make you, you go with the assumption that they're interested, and you may, and you let them know that it's very hard to attain, but very very valuable. As a student, you're just gonna annoy me if you tell me. I mean, honestly, I think it's a very noble idea. I really do, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I think it's a beautiful, noble idea, and I think in an idealistic world, if if Everybody was the same. Be like, oh my God, that's that's right. If I work hard, it 
it would be so valuable to me. But if I'm busy and I'm annoyed and the world, the whole message I hear from the world is, if you don't get a degree, all you're going to be making your whole life is $7 an hour and time is money, time is money, so get through it and you know what, all I want is you just give me an A and I want to get out of here because I want to get to a four-year college and after I get a four-year college, I want to get the hell out of there because I want to go to get my master's and after I get out of there, I want to get the hell out of there so I want to get a job. When I get a job, I want to get the hell out of there so I can retire early. <laughs> 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 and then you die. And then you die. No, then I want to go on vacation and travel. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to be like, yes, but I want to work really hard because I have other classes and I have other stuff to read and it takes time. And I'm not, the best class I ever had, to be honest, and I know other students probably be like, oh man, why did you say that? But the best class I ever had was the, when the teacher demanded my respect and demanded my attention. Not like, you have to work harder, like, all right, I'll make it easier on you. We're like, shut up, listen, and do your work. And that was it. And the, t the class was interested. It was my human sexuality class. It was a fascinating class. I loved it. The teachers were funny. They were strong, and they came at me, and I respected them. I loved it. They demanded my my attention, and I loved that class. It was my favorite class, not because of the material, but because of the way they came at me. Uh, I mean, I, yeah, I agree with you. I think what um, what I was suggesting earlier is that um, I think it's incumbent upon us to let our students know that we recognize the difficulties under which they're trying to learn without in any way surrendering the standards that we set, not that they set, that's my opposition to the marketplace. For example, I know what many of my students want. They want an easy grade with as little, uh, you know, good easy grade with as little work as possible. And the very study I've seen shows, it's not just here, uh, Cornell recently, you know, a couple years ago, Cornell uh, started publishing uh, the mean grades in every course to show the relevance, uh, the relativity of whatever grade you got, thinking, that students would be drawn to courses uh, with lower mean grades because if the mean grade of a course is a C minus, you got a B. You did really well. No, it's worked exactly the opposite. Over the last two years, the trend has been toward the courses with the higher mean grades, and uh, because obviously that's the end. That we don't do. We don't ask students what they want. There was a study at Florida State recently. The history department was losing the FTE because it was losing students. So they figured, well, let's ask the students what topics they want in history, what isn't covered. Uh, the number one topic, especially among men, and this is Florida, was uh, I want more military history and battles. Okay, suppose as a professional historian, I think that it's more important to look at the economic and material relations of your society, the intersection of race and gender and class and so on, and whether I'm right or wrong, that's my professional judgment. Does that mean I should follow my professional judgment or I should look at the marketplace desires of my customers? No, I'm not going to do that, whether they like it or not. Uh, and, and so, so that's the difference, I think. We have to know what our students want. We have to know what their, their needs and what the pressures they're living under, but we can't yield to them in a certain sense. I mean, you can be sympathetic without sort of being used as, well, okay, you, know, you don't have to do it because you're too busy. That, that we don't do. No, but it, it also has to do with that. I think, I think we're actually reaping. Uh, what we have sown uh, for decades, what has been going, I don't have kids, and I have not had kids in elementary school, but I think we're actually seeing some of the results of um, making what kids have learned in elementary school uh, a game, something nice, something less challenging, uh, because now they're not used to meeting challenges, and it's supposed to be what they feel like doing rather than what we think is necessary. Well, so, I, but that, those are rumors I'm repeating. Well, I'll substantiate them. I do have kids who have gone through public education. And uh, it, it's, it's frankly quite weak. Uh, and, uh, you know, new governmental policies have made it worse. I mean, No Child Left Behind is a great example. I mean, uh, there's a law that essentially tells you history isn't worth shit because uh, we're going to concentrate on test taking and basic math and, and, uh, and uh, English literacy, not history. Uh, this hurts all the more. Um, his, history teachers are not particularly well trained. You can teach history at the high school level in California uh, without being a history major, without being a history minor, and in fact with having taken almost no lower division courses in history. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what do you know? Well, what you know is, uh, is very little. Uh, I, I mean, so it, it, that is a problem. We're, we're using the students for that. Um, yes? Um, well, I definitely um, agree. I think about our educational system not being in standards as a correlation to Europe. I mean, for their high school diploma, they have to speak 
three languages and have a very in-depth analysis in, in chemistry or at sciences and languages. Just, I mean, I don't want to be harsh to our edu educational system here, but to get a GED, you don't really have to be that knowledgeable. Personally, I mean, I, I went to a private school all my life up until my first year of college, and even then, I wasn't, my priorities were not um, to actually be interested in the knowledge that I'm actually attaining. It was, you know, you got to learn this stuff so you can get into college. And to get into a good college, then that determines what your, the rest of your life is going to be like. And with our world, I mean, not only is it very independent, egalitarian, egalitarian, egalitarian. egalitarian sorry, it's just, I mean, the whole mental process of all these people in my generation is that, you know, everything's moving at a constant speed and you better catch up or else you're going to be left behind in the dust. As a student, I, I'm very stressed out constantly. Uh, uh, to that, you know, I can add, as uh, Charlie mentioned that also, about the, the level of, of education at, uh, you know, when, when we went to school and also elsewhere, you know, since Angela mentioned Germany, uh, that uh, there was some, there was a style of getting education. I got my education in Europe that you don't just uh, read, you don't just study your field. You spend the rest of your day going to other lectures and you don't get credit for it, but that's just what you do. So as a matter of fact, you, you probably take three degrees at the same time because you have all that knowledge, but nobody cares because you don't get any kind of diploma. But it's just expected of you. And it's no longer that way anymore uh, in Europe uh, because they are getting toward the, uh, the, the point system also. Yes. Um, Angela. Yeah, just one I just want to make a suggestion. I think I have a solution. I, I don't know if my colleagues here, my political science colleagues, agree with me, but I've heard so many uh, comments about oh, wanting to understand direct democracy, and what monarchy is, what political philosophy is, and what political parties are. <coughs> Maybe you sh we should just sort of switch it around and say that the students should take political science classes first before they go into history. And then they will now. already have that foundation. <laughs> I, nice try. It would be so best. They would really have a real understanding of what government structure is and of what the whole system is. And also they won't work. care. They won't well, care. You know, that is your job to give them that. No. no, 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 no. Oh, yeah. No. Okay. You know, if we're dealing with a situation where they just don't care about anything, we can't do it. Why do we have a See, what, we, what we've done in here very often is, in order to make us feel good, we've gotten anecdotal. We talk about this great student, this good student, all that. And that's just to make us feel good. And we know as teachers, we don't, you don't have to be much of a good teacher to teach good students. They're pretty, you know, I was self-perpetuating. I, I, I tell my students, you're not educated until you leave a classroom. It's what you do outside a classroom. There's not enough time to do much in a classroom, but your education takes off when it's when you're out. And to you know, transfigure a little phrase from Tolstoy, you know, interested students are all alike. Disinterested students are disinterested each in their own way. And it's that problem of separating these. We're there. I mean, I, I grew up with a lot of kids in the 60s, and they weren't interested in history like I was, you know, and interested in this, this, and this. In fact, we had a big reunion this past weekend. And um, so this distinction has always been there. I just, I think it's just gotten much more critical now, this distinction. And I think the piles of interested versus disinterested students have shifted, and there's much more disinterest. You know, a great deal. You know, we can, we can anecdotally we have our great students who go to Berkeley and we and do that, and we can be very proud of them. But I always notice the empty seats and the rest of them with the heads on the tables and stuff like that. And there's a tragedy, you know, in our midst going on. And I don't think by reinventing the wheel for the good students that we're going to hit these 
disinterested students. I mean, um, you said something before that that oh, you know I, I I'm linking up to what you're saying now. Um, so I'm holding you to your own words. Okay. <laughs> uh, that that you know, we we from the '60s uh, carry some kind of, of responsibility, and uh, you know, I, I am I am thinking that perhaps we need to go uh, you know earlier than the educational system, and that has that actually links me up with uh, something that that Arlene was talking about and the storytelling aspect. That if we can't get support from from anywhere else in terms of making students uh, connect with the past, enthusiastic about the past, if they are too busy, uh, if, if uh, you know, they, they feel disconnected with, with the culture, etc., um, then maybe some of the blame is not just that the parents can't handle uh, you know, the, the miseries of, of uh, their own generation. Maybe it's because there's something that's been lost. And here I'm actually, uh, I'm channeling Alistair McIntyre because it's, it's his idea, it's not mine. But uh, you know, if we if we focus, if we if we try not to forget uh, what was what is closest to us, meaning the family stories, uh, if if families would bring back the idea of telling about where, uh, uh, you know, the the anecdotal stuff, what grandpa did, what grandma did, etc. But putting it in the context of this, these days when, when so many people are actually more interested in their multicultural background, this should be easy to bring in. If we can revive the family stories, and my family's really big on stories, so I got, <laughs> I, okay, I'm not going to go there. Uh, but the family stories could link up to the local stories, could link up to uh, you know, the, the, the larger, the larger the stories. Of course oh, you're related to John Wayne Gacy. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that'll get you know, a lot of attention. I mean, there's a lot of family <laughs> stories that a lot of people keep quiet for good reasons. Why are you putting so much focus on pride? I think it's a huge motive. I think it's a huge but, motive. I mean, when when day, something's flattering, people from. gravitate it like a moth to a flame. But even wherever you come from, you can teach your children this what was, this what is, and we're going to be better than what was. Uh, that's that's pretty abstract. If If... If your family background is not flattering, I don't think people like to be reminded of it. But you I like, like I bet you down family. south they don't they don't have uh, the classes that talk about plantations are but overflowing. There's, there's, a, there's a moral lesson in that too. I yeah. mean, uh, you know, one of uh, I don't know is Hayden White a name who's known among historians? Okay, because yeah. uh, you know he's uh, he's in literature and history at the same time. I I, I found him to be uh, you know he was uh, really an eye opener for me many years ago. Where he's talking about that all history is uh, is a pretty much essentially moralizing history, and all stories told have this element of well this is uh, this is what these people did do the same or don't do the same. So family histories they have a a, a, a moral aspect to them also. And that means that we can bring up, well, granddad was a horse thief. Uh, you know, what, what do we do about that? Well, for one thing, a lot of people are going to find that fascinating. Uh, but then we say, well, okay, let's not do what grandpa did. So uh, you know, telling the family stories, it gets the background, but it also gets some kind of, of uh, edge. This, this, this is where I come from. This is where I should not go. Uh, I don't see anything wrong with that. I yeah, mean, people do bad things. What are Catholics supposed to be stuck being Catholic because of a few bad priests or churches? Well, I don't think like Catholics them. spend a lot of time reading Malcolm Hay and finding out the roots of Christian anti-Semitism. Uh, that's not big on their list. I, I think people vote with their feet. You know, when, when they show an interest, there's something self-serving about it. There is a it. lot of bad history yeah. and a lot of things that are now pretty hardcore rooted. Yeah. Yeah. In a lot of religions and a lot of uh -huh. families and a lot of na nations and tribes. And uh -huh. So, I mean, and it's all part of what they are now and what they are today. It's like, it's like personal history. You know, you go through experiences and it, and it makes you who you are today. Yeah, but lots of people are trying. The point is, I think lots of people are trying to avoid that. That's, yeah. that's what the symptom is. They are but denying this. What's why, that? Why avoid truth? If the truth is painful, I think there will be a great incentive not to. No, but then you're not encompassing history. So I'm trying to understand why people might not be interested, and I think that's a great reason. But you hear many people today saying, I thank for my sorrows and I thank for the painful experiences because without them I would not be the person I am today. Yeah, some people do that, you know, but they're generally in pretty good shape now because of that. They can thank their lucky stars for it. 
But people who haven't but gotten out of the, we have to say anyway. it doesn't but people who haven't stronger. gotten out of a quagmire aren't noted for thanking you know their bad circumstances for their bad circumstances. Yeah, everybody's going to have their time when they can deal with something. But I think it's true of people that they're going to have their time when they can get the most out of our class too. I mean, a student that might not get that much out of our class at one time might come back later and get a lot out of the class. Everybody has their time and it, and. The, the material has to connect with where they are, you know, in their lives and in their thinking. So, so we t we take the students as they are and try to give them as much material that uh, as possible to work with, and some things they're going to connect with more than others. Like we learn. Well, I want if this discussion is over, I want to break it. But before we leave, I do want to uh, make a, a comment yes. about some suggestions for okay. engaging right. students. Right. Right. So uh, let's let's do last commentary about this, and then uh, uh, we'll we'll give the panelists a chance to uh, make more final remarks. Yes. Like we learned the the time cycle. In this in this civilization, we look we see time as going from one point to the other, from past to future. So, I mean, it's very difficult to blame the generation for, like, why should we look back? We're only going forward. And in those times, well, now we have a whole new model, the new age. We're in the new age, you know what I mean? Like, and everything we see, like, now we don't have books, now we have a TV and an internet, and everything we have today is all about focusing on the future, the new car, and the new cell phone, and you know, so now we have the iPhone that has a camera, a phone, everything in it, a computer, like, you know what I mean? Like, we're moving towards something new, something new, something new, something new, so why would go back where things were, things were, well, not worse, but like, not as exciting and not as advanced. And that, is, that is probably where Dwight's suggestion will pay off more than anything else. Uh, we would not have the iPod had we not had the uh, transistor radio and so forth. Oh, I mean, they're at basic level. And probably, probably suggesting to people, saying to them that like, think about when your grandchildren look back on you today, thinking, oh my God, how did you get with an iPhone when we now have the i, just i or whatever, you know? So I mean, maybe if like they relate to that thought, they can relate to learning about and, that. And one thing that we can do, I mean, under those circumstances, focus on the excitement of somebody getting the latest BlackBerry or whatever. Uh, relating that to uh, gee, when uh, you know, grandpa got that first radio where they had to put the uh, headphones down in a you know, in a bowl, and that's how they listen. Uh, so the human experience of it, uh, yeah. rather than the sure. technology of it. Okay, uh, tell me. Oh, well, I was just thinking about the when you were talking about the storytelling. Is that you know, I think that's that's something that's important. I know with my family, you know, you but you have you're relying on people that. Uh, you know, we're 90 years old, uh, you know, and, and they tell those stories, and those stories had some, and I don't know how much this, how important this is, but, it's, you know, that story had some uh, relevancy past the United States, okay? And I think it's in many ways after, you know, we've only been here, what, a couple hundred years or something like that. After a while, uh, generations go by, and pretty soon, two things. One is that you know, the history doesn't go anywhere past the United States. People can be in the middle of the United States for two or three generations and never even see the coast. And, uh, and then uh, it's incumbent upon everybody, every generation, to keep telling those stories, right? And if we stop, yeah, but it, it's, then it, 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 it gets lost. I'm much more pessimistic about this. I've taught a lot of humanities classes, and one of the things I ask on the first day is how many of you can name your eight great grandparents, and most people most people can't. And if you you can't name your own parents, your own ancestors, then strangers have got no chance. Because I think people really vote with their feet. They're not interested, and they show you they're not interested. And I think if we don't take that at face value, that's going to be the rock in our shoe forever. You know, that, that's, that's a given right there. What I'd, I'd like to do is, uh, I, I feel so guilty about uh, talking so 
uh, starkly about uh, how it's nearly impossible to engage students in the, the academic study of history, that I just wanted to leave you with a couple suggestions about some possible ways to do so, uh, some of which I've done effectively and some of which I haven't been able to implement. Um, because there are ways. I mean, I think the one way is to, uh, uh, to really teach around a theme which clearly relates past to present. I'm not going backward or forward or anything, but I think, and what I've, uh, what I've done with quite a bit of success the last two years is uh, sort of talked about the concepts of freedom and equality. And, and the reason that I started doing this is really, I, it, it, it sort of painfully dawned upon me a couple years ago how many times George Bush said the word freedom. He said 15, 20 times in, in a short uh, uh, presentation. And, you know, obviously he likes it. And most Americans think freedom is great and it's wonderful and equality is good. So but the problem is, if you look closely at American history, there are dozens and dozens of different meanings about what those words mean. They're always contested and they've changed over time. So what I do, starting with early colonial U.S. history, is I start constantly making references to what freedom and equality meant to different groups of people at that particular point, and then I'll go forward to what it means today, and I'll go backward again. And I found that that does interest some students. Again, there's some that don't give a damn about anything. They're not going to be interested. But it does draw the interest from, from some who might otherwise not, I think, have, have sort of seen the relevance of history. That I've been able to do successfully. Another thing is, is to, to not hesitate to bring uh, your own scholarship uh, and research experiences into the teaching of history because this is the way students uh, uh, engage our enthusiasm. They, you know, they see why actually there's something exciting about uh, intellectual discovery. I bet because we've experienced that we still do. Uh, and again, this reaches some students. Others are going to think you're just an old fool. But there are some that are going to very much tap into that. And I think that's worth doing. One last thing. Um, I think we really have to do, we have to try to make effective uh, popular cultural links to the past without pandering. Okay. And this isn't easy to do. I've always made a popular cultural illusions throughout my whole teaching career. The problem is nobody gets them anymore because you know, it's a popular culture which is apart from that. So what I think we need to do is learn what is a, a part of a, a reachable popular culture today. And uh, you know, my example is uh, one of my old graduate professors at Berkeley, uh, Leon Litwack, who's a, big, you know, a very accomplished scholar, uh, Pulitzer Prize winner, uh, one of the best teachers I've ever seen. Uh, and uh, you know, 77 years old, now just retired. Uh, what Litwack has done his entire career, and still does, is he will, for example, if he's teaching uh, about African American culture, he will take rap music, both commercial and that which is, which is in fact somewhat more meaningful. And he will, he knows it very well, he'll play snippets of it, he'll quote it, and then he'll compare it uh, to say uh, uh, songs that say someone like Curtis Mayfield may, may have written a song in the 60s, uh, and show the differences and indicate what this might mean about changes in African American culture over a 30 or 40 year period. Uh, and uh, I thought, I think that is enormously effective and it's not pandering. Uh, I haven't been able to do it because the only problem is before you can understand rap music, you have to listen to it. And I don't want to do that. But I think it's worth doing. And I'm going to make myself do it one of these days. We will, uh, I'll find out um, any comments from, from Arlene or Dwight. Um, I spend my life mostly 2007 BC. <laughs> and so, I'm, I, you know, I, I have the feeling, as I've been listening, I think my students come in and it's a fantasy. I, it made me think about this. They've come into this fant fantasy of the ancient world. And I won't say you see the... <sighs> okay, to close out the world, I often will have some slides, not many, three, four, close the door, and they're in another world. I think, you know, it made me think about this. Um, and, and I do use, um, you know, references, but I don't use any, I, you know I don't use tapes, I don't use movies, I don't use any of this stuff. I talk about it, and they say to me, how about the mummy returns? Yeah. <laughs> and give me your take on it. And I'd say, well, this and this and this and this, you know. We don't watch it, because a couple of them said, can we watch it? No, we can't watch it. <laughs> no extra credit. No, no, no. But I think it is. It's, they're, they're retreating, and, and I bet with philosophy, they retreat into a fantasy world. Have you watched that uh, 
special on Discovery Channel? Of course. <laughs> and I've been a consultant. I mean, I've been a consultant in Las Vegas, and I've been, you know, and my, my uh, uh, I, I mean, you know, I'm a serious Egyptologist. I'm mentioned in the British Museum's Dictionary of Egyptology. I mean, uh, I've done research big time. Yeah. I'm internationally known in certain fields. And students do get a kick out of it because I say, and then here's what I did, and here's what I did, and here's what I did, and they're going, oh, you did that. <laughs> you went to Germany and tried on a mask? Yeah. But you know, I think it is a fantasy, and I think that's what happens. And I can drag them along into a different level. I feel kind of sorry when you're trying to do Andrew Jackson, though. <laughs> yeah. You know, I was thinking about it. it. It's it's funny when you come to a talk like this because every field has its own problems and its faces, right? And it it, it always thinks of itself as the uh, the one that's the worst off, right? So I go into a political science class and I always feel like, oh God, it's so bad because the students are cynical about politics. Oh yeah. Right, and so I'm always you know battling against that. And history is what I use sure. as a draw. That's what I use to get them interested in the <laughs> debates. Without, without then having to you know, engage their own personal disputes about politics. And for us, it's a way of disengaging from those kind of very personal debates that some of the students want to get into in class. So it's interesting to come in and see it from the other perspective, like trying to get them interested in history. Like, well, <laughs> history is what I use to get them interested in politics, or at least get beyond those, you know, Problematic debates and stuff. Yeah, she's right. I mean, you can get them arguing like Henry Clay versus Andrew Jackson, and they can be, they can talk about it sometimes much more articulately yes. than they could talk about things today. And they, they start could, calling themselves name, each other names. Well, and they talk about current politics. And there's a dis can, you know, there's enough distance so yeah. that so so that you don't take it too seriously. Yes, that's what I was thinking when Arlene was talking about it. It's true. Question. Yeah, I, I think it's important um, that we do try to understand what the sources of these dis, the disinterest is. Uh, and I think, I mean, Charlie was right to mention, I think, a lot of the social, economic, and political conditions that give rise to it. Um, but I also think that in history, we're fighting what this young lady here mentioned a few minutes ago is focus on the new, the novel. Uh, this is part of, it's been part of American culture for a long, long time. And it's accelerating, okay, because of new technology and so on. The attitude that well, the past is the past, and this is a new age. Uh, and I really do think a lot of uh, you know our students think of this age as something new. Um, and so the question is, well, why go back? Um, and I think if there's one a, a, a part of what we think we have to get clear on is why, what we want students to come away with when they take a history course. And it seems to me that the fundamental thing you want them to come away with is the notion that the, the, the past is still living, as you suggested before. It's still, that, that is, you can't understand the new uh, without understanding the causal patterns uh, that enables us to get here. We can't deal with the new unless we understand those causal patterns. Um, and, um, and, and so that's why I think this notion of teaching history backwards has, a, and some of the things that some of you have mentioned about going back and forth, I think that's right. Uh, I'm not so sure that teaching in a strictly reverse chronological ma uh, manner is going to work, at least I don't clearly see how that would work. Um, but this notion of going back and forth, it seems to me, to, uh, to try to show them that history has uh, these long tentacles that, uh, that reach into the present, uh, that's what you want them to come away with, it seems to me. Uh, and that's why I think the present uh, is very important to teaching history. Um. I only teach one class uh, in a chronological way, and that's philosophy 125, which is philosophy of women. And that class demands that we look at the development of um, philosophy's view on women and uh, women's contribution to philosophy in a historical way, because it is a progression. So that's why I choose that rather than a topical approach, which I use in, in just about all the other classes. Uh, but even in that class, uh, I do the jumping back and forth. Uh, between the, the modern times and uh, and ancient times, otherwise, uh, um, I, I otherwise actually the truth probably is that otherwise I'm not passionate about it, mm -hmm. and maybe that's maybe that I mean, on an again the anecdotal level, but maybe that's what it comes down to at at 
what we talk about in terms of, of uh, uh, reaching our students, that maybe it's our passion that counts more than anything else. Because um, if that's not there, then we're not going to accomplish anything. Could those be the final words? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much.